broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, uh, and thanks for joining. My name is Jared Maynard, and uh, I put together this seminar on pain science. Um, this this came around because I was talking to uh, to Quinn a little while ago, and was mentioning how uh, at the clinic that I work at up here in Ontario, Canada, we wanted to try to do something that um, uh, helped us to engage the the public and gave them some free, useful information that they can start to apply themselves uh, apply to themselves right now. And so we started a seminar, um, a series of seminars, and this was one of them that I had put together. And Quinn thought this might be of use to uh, the Clinical Athlete Network. So here we go. So here's a quick overview of what you can expect during the course of this presentation. So first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then we'll get into some of the big topics like what pain is, uh, the differences and similarities between acute and chronic pain, whether or not we should uh, get diagnostic imaging or whether it's useful or not, and if it is useful, what sort of circumstances those would be, what clinicians can and cannot do to help your pain, and then mostly important, most important, what you can do or what the, the person watching this lecture can do. Um, quick note about how this seminar is put together. Uh, it was meant for, or it is meant for, anyone and everyone to listen. Definitely geared towards general population, people that don't quite have a a healthcare background. So as we're going, if, if it seems a little bit lower level, just because most people watch are probably pretty familiar with some of the stuff. Jared. Jared. Jared, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hey, sorry about that. We're going to start over. Uh, you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if you're moving away from the computer or... Uh, I, I may have been, so I can just try to stay a little closer. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you're still you're still cutting out a little bit. Okay. Um, let me. Let me give me one sec. I can grab a pair of headphones that should have a mic to them. Okay. Yeah. Do that. We'll just start. We'll just start over. I want to catch it before we get too deep into it. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate that. No problem. All right, let's see if this works. Can you hear me now? I can. Is that any different from before or pretty well the same? That is crystal clear, actually. Oh, awesome. All right. So I'll get this queued back up. Okay. Uh, wait, are you talking right now? No, not yet. There is something going on, and it hmm. is... audio thing it is let me see here it just seems to be cutting out am i coming through okay you're coming through fine yeah okay yeah it seems to be cutting out a little bit is there um i can see if i wonder why that is yeah my wi-fi signal looks like it's pretty good let me see if mine make sure mine's all good here let me make sure I don't know why that would be on my end. If it's an audio thing, that's your screen. Mm. Hang on one second. Everything's good over here. Um, what about, hmm. <laughs> I'll 
let's just let's go ahead and uh, start talking again. So we'll see if you cut out. For sure. Yeah, it, right, right off the bat, it cut out. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Um, let me let me see if uh, I think I've got a. I might have an Ethernet cable downstairs. Um, the only additional challenge would be that uh, my wife and kids are down there, um, so we might get some some periodic baby noises in the background. You're fine right now. Right now, it's hmm. fine. Okay. Do you want to give it a whirl and just yeah? I mean, we're recording, so let's just let's just go. All right, cool. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Jared Maynard. I'm a physiotherapist up in Bowmanville, Ontario, Canada, and uh, this is a presentation about pain science, as the title gives away. Uh, this came about because I was speaking to Quinn a little while ago and letting him know about how, at the clinic that I'm working at, we wanted to start to do something that allowed us to engage uh, the general public. Um, and provide them with some free, useful information that they can use immediately after finding out about it. So we started up a series of, uh, of workshops or seminars, and this is one of the installments. And Quinn thought this might have some value to the people of the Clinical Athlete Network. So here we go. And so here's a brief overview of what's coming up in the presentation. So first is who am I? And I'll give you a little info about that. And then we'll get into uh, the questions, what pain is? differences between acute and chronic pain and maybe their similarities as well. Whether or not we should seek out diagnostic imaging and if it's helpful for us, uh, and if it is, what circumstances might be helpful in, what clinicians can and can't do to help your pain, and then most importantly is what you can do. So quick note about how this seminar is formatted. This is meant for, again, uh, anyone and everyone to listen. Uh, and to understand. So this, if it seems a little bit lower level, um, given that I'm assuming most people who are listening to this right now have a pretty good understanding of uh, most or all of the information in the seminar, just know that, that uh, the target audience was people who aren't so smart, you smart sons of guns. So, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a physiotherapist, as I mentioned. I did my honors um, Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology at McMaster University, and then I did my Master in Physio at Queen's University, both up here in Canada. I'm a proud clinical athlete provider. I'm the co-owner of Axolotl Strength, which is an online powerlifting coaching company, and we've produced some national and international level competitors in the Canadian Powerlifting Union. In addition to coaching, I compete myself um, in the CPU. I'm currently a 93 kilo lifter, but looking to move on up to the 105s, which means lots of food in my future, and that's not a bad problem to have. And this isn't my line, uh, but I like it anyway, so I used it. Uh, I definitely don't know everything, but I'm always trying to be a little less wrong. Shout outs to Michael Wright, that comes from you, I think. All right, so gotta give credit where it's due, and much of what's in this presentation comes from the Clinical Athlete Scientific Principles of Sports Rehab course, which I took in Ottawa, Ontario in September of this past year. Um, it's probably the most useful course that I've ever taken um, uh, out, coming out of school, and I highly recommend it to anyone and everyone interested. So as I mentioned, I've stolen a bunch of info from the uh, from the notes. Didn't have to do too much legwork, um, and I've tried to cite everything that's not my own. And I've got a full list of references at the end, which I can send to anybody interested. Uh, so big thanks to Michael Ray and Derek Miles. You guys did a phenomenal job, and it was a phenomenal experience. And also a big shout out to Dr. Greg Lehman, whose Pain Recovery si Strategies Guidebook uh, was also a big help in putting this seminar together. If anyone hasn't seen it, uh, he's got a free copy uploaded on his website there. Um, if you haven't, haven't read it, it's probably something that you might want to do. Um, I find it really, really helpful. You can give pages straight out of it to patients. So let's get into it. What is pain? These are quotes which you may have seen. It's an unpleasant sensory experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage with sensory, emotional, cognitive, and social components. It's a survival mechanism, the expression of which is naturally selected for. So it's a useful thing to our survival uh, and thriving as humans, which is kind of an interesting way to think about pain. And it's also an experience which is dependent on the interaction of subjective perception, learned responses, and observable expression. So it seems to be less like this, which was an earlier model, um, which is kind of a straight biomechanical approach to understanding pain. There seemed to be a one, or it was thought that there was a one-to-one -one ratio between 
the physical stimuli, in this case of the fire, and the pain that the person would experience. And there, they thought that there were tubes that led from the different parts of the body up to the brain, and that's what caused the, uh, the pain experience. So we know it's less like that. It seems to be more like this, where we do have the physical stimuli or the tissue damage potentially, but it's also our pain experiences are going to be influenced by communicative behavior, social response, pain experience, the protective behavior, um, our memories of pain, uh, many other things beyond just the physical stimulus. So that's important for us to understand. So let's talk about the process of pain. And how do we get to being painful in the first place? So we've got two key players. We've got the spinal cord and the brain. And some ways that you can think about this are maybe the spinal cord is the executive assistant at a company and the brain is the big head honcho, uh, the big boss. Um, and a different analogy that works just as well is that the spinal cord might be the first mate on a ship and the brain would be the, uh, the captain on that ship. So to get pain, you might have some unpleasant or noxious stimuli that can stimulate the receptors in the body. Um, and these, these receptors are originally called nociceptors. Um, and that sends potential danger signals to the spinal cord for the processing. And so from here, the spinal cord can decide if the information needs to be sent up to the brain or if it is processed at the level of the spinal cord itself. So this is kind of like the executive assistant deciding if certain uh, information needs to be forwarded on to the boss in the middle of a meeting or if they can be handled without disturbing the boss. Know that these are potential danger signals about pressure, temperature, things like that. So for example, if you've been sitting for too long right now, you might have some nociception about pressure coming from your buttocks and your legs. Um, it's not really a threat, but it generates that signal anyway. So this is really why we need extra processing to figure out if the nociception that we're getting is really something that we need to worry about or take action on. So the brain ultimately decides what to do with the information that reaches it. Um, it's going to take the information it's getting and weigh it out with other information like past experiences of pain, whether it's been expecting pain to arise at some point in the, in, you know, the near future, how focused it is on pain at that moment. So pain is really plain and simply meant to act as an alarm system, which brings our attention to something so that we can take appropriate action. And that's what stops you from keeping your hand on a hot stove or from walking on a broken ankle. After an acute injury, pain tends to be fairly proportional or more proportional at least to the damage that's been sustained. And this is an example of pain working how we want it to, and that's why it's been uh, naturally selected for and helpful for our survival as humans. So these are the take home points from this section. One, pain is an alarm system. It's meant to tell you about something that might need your attention and to potentially get you to act on it. Your brain and spinal cord play very important roles in processing pain. And nociception does not always lead to pain. It's one component, but pain depends on many other factors as well. So let's get into talking about acute and chronic pain uh, and what they are, what they're not, that sort of thing. So depending on factors like injury timeline and the presence or absence of a plausible mechanism of injury or MOI, we tend to classify pain into two main categories. Those are acute and chronic. Chronic is also called persistence, depends on um, perhaps what word choice you'd like to use. Um, and I'll also say that when it comes to these two categories, the next things that are going to pop up on the screen, they're generalities. They're not by any means hard and fast. There are definitely exceptions that exist between them. But typically, if we're going to classify something as acute, it's probably been around for less than three months or so versus chronic, where it might be around for three months or longer. Acute injuries typically have a mechanism of injury, so it could be trauma, a training error, or things of that nature, versus chronic, which often lacks a mechanism of injury. It may have had one, um, but perhaps that mechanism doesn't quite suffice in explaining why the, the persistent pain is what it is at that moment or why it hasn't resolved, and that sort of thing. Acute pain, as I mentioned a few slides ago, tends to correlate better with stages of tissue healing versus chronic, where it's often very dis disproportionate to the stage of tissue healing. Um, it's not uncommon to find someone with chronic pain in some area of their body. Um, they might have some diagnostic imaging, which shows that the tissues look fine. Maybe there's, there's not a sufficient enough lesion or something that, that really explains why they've got pain at all, or maybe there's nothing, nothing on the t at the tissue level, and yet they've got very severe pain. Um, that's a fairly common scenario. 
And note that exceptions, as I mentioned before, can definitely exist between these categories. And, and this discussion about pain is really framed in the context of musculoskeletal issues. So it's not really taking into account other systemic issues that could cause pain, maybe acute pain that doesn't have a mechanism and that sort of thing. So talking quickly about the stages of tissue healing, <clears throat> again, these are going to be guidelines and exactly how long each one lasts is going to depend on the situation that we're talking about. But three main stages, inflammatory repair and remodel remodeling. Um, in the inflammatory stage, something has just happened. We've just had the, the injury, whether it's a trauma or something else. Uh, we're probably getting an influx of inflammatory chemicals, which are going to sensitize the nerve endings in the area. Uh, we probably have an influx of fluid, which can cause swelling. Um, and we're probably going to have some clotting if any blood vessels have been disrupted and there's any bleeding. So this can last a day, can last several days, can last a week, and it depends. And then we move into the repair phase where we've got uh, generation of new blood vessels. Again, if any were disrupted initially, we've got less swelling. Um, the swelling's on its way out. We probably have a little less sensitization. And then we've got lots of cells, lots of fibroblasts that are hard at work laying down new tissue. And this is, this is scar tissue. This is immature, pretty weak scar tissue, but it's scar tissue nonetheless. Quick scar sidebar, um, scar tissue tends to have a bit of a bad rap, depending on who you talk to. Uh, it seems to be something that we need to break down, something that we need to be afraid of. Um, scar tissue is how the body heals most of its injuries, and it usually goes away or it remodels. You know, that's a heavy hint and segue into the next stage. Um, but it's good. This is this is how we get better from an injury. So into the remodeling phase, this is where the scar tissue, which was immature and uh, fairly weak, gets broken down to a certain extent because in that repair phase we've got the scar tissue laid down every which way and then as we use that body part as it's exposed to certain normal stresses some of those fibers that aren't laid the right way they're going to be broken down new fibers can be laid on top of that stuff's going to be broken down again and then more nude fibers laid on top of that and so on and so forth we probably don't have any swelling left in the area um, the tissue that's left at the end of the remodeling phase is good and strong and it looks a heck of a lot like what was there before and we're, we're usually pretty good to go at this point. So I'm a broken record, but again, timelines will vary depending on what the situation is that we're talking about. So what can we do about an acute injury? Um, off the bat, we can't speed this issue healing. Uh, we just cannot. Uh, there are certain interventions that are theorized to speed tissue healing, <laughs> ultrasound. <laughs> Uh, and we have no good evidence to show that they do, uh, none whatsoever. If that changes at some point in the future, I'll be really happy because it means that there's something else that we can do to help our patients and, and get them better faster. But until that time, I don't think it's worth it to waste time um, and set false expectations or instill false beliefs that don't actually help anything at all. So if that's up, out of the question, what else can we do? First off, it probably helps to set expectations. Um, this is a really important point, I think. Um, having a good, honest, uh, open discussion with a patient right from the get-go helps to avoid um, a lot of headaches for everybody down the road. If you as the clinician think uh, or know that their injury, maybe they're dealing with a tendinous issue and they're gonna be looking at six to eight weeks of rehab time before they're back to normal, but that person thinks you're gonna play in the tournament in three days, that's going to be a bit of a problem. So having that conversation right from the get-go um, sets you up for probably a better result overall. We can then try to create a good environment for healing. So this can take a few different forms. It might involve protecting the, the injured area, um, and that could mean just trying to not move into those uh, painful or aggravating positions or do those painful movements. It could mean using a brace or something else to uh, provide some external support. It can also mean trying to educate the patient on what good sleeping habits might be, on what helpful nutrition would be, getting the body the nutrients that it needs as it tries to get better from whatever's going on. It could be trying to reduce emotional or mental stresses. And these might seem like a little bit, uh, might seem like strange things to focus on as we're trying to fix you know, a physical problem, but they go a long way and lots of little changes can equate to a big useful change want to figure out a path to, to the goal that's important to, to the patient in front of you. And this does a couple of things. One is it instills confidence in them that you as the clinician know how to get them where they want to go. Secondly, let's say you're at point A, 
This is the first meeting, and the patient wants to get to point M, which is their return to play. Um, if they have only those two points, there's a long, lonely space in between those two, and that can be really tough for, uh, for them to go through and tough for you as a clinician as you deal with an unhappy and frustrated patient. Rather, if you set out points B, C, D, E, F, and so forth, that gives them the ability to do a few things further. One is tick off little boxes and, and experience little PRs on the way back to or on their way to the ultimate goal. It allows them to, to have mile markers and have objective ways of saying, hey, I'm getting better. You know, I couldn't squat to a box before, but now I can. Now I can squat to a lower box and now I don't need the box at all. And now I can back squat and now I can jump and so forth. Um, it makes the whole process probably a lot more bearable. And then finally, you want to minimize dependency on other things. Um, one line that I've stolen from a previous instructor that I think fits really well is that um, I tell people that if I never see them in this clinic again, I'll be really happy. And if the end goal is to get them self-sufficient and not needing anything in my clinic, um, then I probably want to use as little, uh, as few passive modalities as I can. Um, I'm not anti-passive modality, and I'll make concessions certainly if the situation seems like it merits it. Mostly, though, it's if the patient thinks that it's going to be useful. If they've had some ultrasound or some TENS and that made them feel a lot better, I'll probably make that concession as long as we continue to focus on the other stuff, which we know is going to get them better, the fastest, and uh, the most totally. Some final things to think about in terms of acute pain. So we definitely want to talk about what training or activities happened leading up to the injury. Um, if it was a trauma, uh, that's a pretty clear sort of, sort of case. We know what happened, but a lot of times we'll be seeing someone, let's say they're a runner, and nothing traumatic happened. They didn't change their footwear. They didn't change their running style. But three weeks ago, their knee just started to really kill them. So that's probably the time where you want to ask about what their training has looked like. If they've done any sort of or made any sort of changes to their training. Because if you find out that four weeks ago or five weeks ago, they upped their weekly mileage by 20 kilometers, that might be your issue. And as we get people better, get them ready to kind of be on their own again, we want to make sure that they don't wind up coming through our door for the same issue. So figuring out what led to the injury in the first place is pretty important. We want to reintroduce some tolerable movements as quick as we can. And that does a few things too. Like we said, especially in that remodeling phase is the the new tissue is being uh, reformed. The, the stuff that's not helpful is broken away and the stuff that is helpful sticks around. We want to gradually expose that injured area to what the injured area is gonna have to do. What does a normal shoulder do, a normal knee do and so forth. Um, plus, if they're an athlete, there's no sense usually in letting their other athletic abilities go to waste while they're trying to get their, you know, their main injury healed. There are usually uh, many things that we can do that at least maintain their athletic ability, maybe they improve some other ones, while we still help the, the injury to get better. Uh, discuss programming and plan during rehab. That is the same stuff that we talked about when we're, we're mentioning figuring out a plan to the goals. Lastly, um, discussing return to sport programming and the plan post rehab is really important. Let's be generous and say that throughout all of rehab, uh, uh, the person comes to you three times a week for an hour, and I think it's pretty generous. For most team sports, it's not unusual to find a five day a week schedule for two and a half hours. So there's a pretty big discrepancy between three total weekly hours and what their sport requires. So uh, Gabbitt, I believe, had done a, uh, a study recently in terms of acute and chronic workload and how there's a sweet spot that helps to reduce injury risk. So we wanna have that discussion with the athlete and we can tell them like, hey, you're getting better, your insert injury here is, is fine, but we need to make sure that you're not gonna hurt it again by going, you know, 20 to 60 within the span of a week. So, and athletes I, I tend to find are pretty helpful at helping you uh, figure out how to get them safely transitioned back to their sport. So all that's talking about chronic pain, or pardon me, acute pain. So now let's talk about chronic pain and how it might differ a little bit. So before, when we were talking about the, uh, the ship example, uh, let's revisit that analogy and let's say that the, the lookouts on the ship, these are the nociceptors, they notice some lights in the distance and these are the potential danger signal um, that creates some nociception for us and told the first mate about it. The first mate's the spinal cord. The captain, i.e. the brain, may also be told about it if the information is seen to be important. If the captain decides that the information is good to know but it's not that, not that important, 
might tell the other crew members, thanks very much, don't worry about it, and everything continues as per normal. Um, the last point about that is maybe the captain knows that they're, they're sailing through a pretty busy shipping lane and that the lights they're seeing are either other ships or lighthouses and they're really nothing, nothing concerning. But if the captain is highly concerned by the information, he might tell the other crew members to stay on high alert for any other related information. Maybe he saw Captain Phillips and doesn't want to be the next person that Tom Hanks plays in a movie. So let's say that they were sailing through some waters that were frequented by pirates and they had reason to be on high alert. But maybe the ships long since cleared that area, but the captain and crew remain hypervigilant. And now normal and helpful signals like the lighthouses or other ships' horns are being perceived as threats. And this is the information, or this is information being misinterpreted and being grossly inaccurate compared to what it actually is. So this is an example of the pain alarm system not working very well like a smoke detector going off and there's no smoke in the house. So with chronic pain, it's dependent on many factors. And this is an illustration from Dr. Greg Lehman's book, just illustrating what these factors might be. So this is an analogy that many clinicians are pretty familiar with, I'd imagine. Um, that's the image of a cup. Um, the cup represents the tolerance of your body systems to handle stresses and everything you do from the second you wake up to the second you fall asleep, add some water to the cup. So that includes physical stuff like sitting, standing, walking, lifting, training, cleaning the house, stuff like that. It also depends on how well or how poorly you slept. If you slept poorly, that's some water in the cup. How good, quote unquote, your nutrition has been relative to general health standards and also what's normal for you. If it's off and if it's not you know, what you're used to or if it's not uh, generally healthy, that's more water. How much mental and emotional stress you have in your life and how much pain seems to be affecting your daily activities and how much you worry about your pain and things like that normally you can go through most days and have some room left at the top of the cup but with chronic pain it's like you have a smaller cup to begin with and almost every day can make the cup overflow so what do we do in this situation well two things really and one is try to put less water in the cup and we'll talk about that later it can be hard to do sometimes the other thing is trying to build a bigger cup, and there's more on that coming up. But the main point here is that pain, especially chronic pain, is dependent on much more than just physical stimuli. So let's talk about placebo and nocebo. These are words that I'm sure most people here are familiar with. Um, the Latin roots come or translate to I shall please, and basically the placebo is something which may not have any physical effect, but still causes someone to feel better. It's got a positive psychosocial context which is capable of influencing the brain and nocebo you know it's evil twin but it's translates to i shall harm and that's something with a negative context which may not have any physical effect but can still cause someone to feel worse so um an example of a placebo that most people are familiar with is taking a sugar pill uh, in, in the context of a drug trial one group gets nothing one group gets a sugar pill but is told it's medication and the third group gets the actual medication we see it many times over that the people that are taking the sugar pill, which have no influence on what the drug is meant to actually change, report that they feel better. Um, there are many, many things which clinicians in the medical or rehab world need to be highly aware of. And that's as simple as the language that we use, which can have enormous effect on how a patient thinks of themselves and their situation. And I subtly tried to create uh, a little bit of a nocebo effect by making the word pain black in the title of these slides. Um, there are so many examples of the same thing happening in the media. So, for example, consider the following, and, and let me check that, uh, examples of this happening in the media as well as just everyday encounters in, uh, in healthcare, healthcare offices or places of work. So, first example, um, let's talk about diagnostic imaging. You could say as a clinician to a patient, I'm sorry, imagine that you're the patient hearing this. Um, your back is full of arthritis, end quote. Or you could hear this. The image shows some arthritic changes, which is entirely normal, and it might not actually have anything to do with your back pain. Different example. You have a frozen shoulder, and there's nothing we can do. Or you could be hearing, your shoulder appears to have a really tough time moving in these ways, and pain is high. It's certainly a tough situation, but it's definitely not the first frozen shoulder ever, and it will get better. And here's what we can expect, and here's what we can do about it. It's not a denial of the facts, but rather a delivering of all of the facts. Namely, the, the point that 
images or the results on an image may not have anything to do with, with pain. And it's, uh, it's delivered in a way that shows understanding of how you're impacting someone's life with the words coming out of their mouths. It also makes good use of the word we, which helps to strengthen what we call the therapeutic alliance, which is be or between the clinician and the patient. It tells the patient in very plain terms that one, they're not in this alone, and two, the clinician cares about helping them to get better. And finally, number three, the clinician has a plan. I think it's really important to try and find the clinicians, doctors, physios, chiros, massage therapists, and so forth, who speak this way. It might seem small, but the small stuff like this has huge effects or huge effects in the clin clinician patient relationships and interactions. So coming up here is a really text heavy slide. Just be warned, we're gonna zip through it pretty quick. So it's talking about the fact that pain is really common. It usually gets better on its own and your MRI or your diagnostic image probably doesn't do a great job of explaining it based on the research. So we know that a heck of a lot of people are gonna experience low back pain at some point in their lives. And that's not, shouldn't be really a surprise. Um, we can have uh, findings of ACE, or pardon me, findings of abnormalities, quote unquote, um, on MRIs or other diagnostic images that occur without symptoms, and that increases in uh, in incidence as age goes up. We can also have a big difference between how long it takes for these radiographic abnormalities to resolve versus how long it takes for the symptoms to go away. So based on those numbers there, coming from Mackey et al. in 2014. Um, people in that study tended to get or tended to feel better within you know a month or two versus it took a lot longer than that for their uh, their radiographs or their images to look any better the worse it looks on an mri the better the chances are of it being resolved on its own so disc sequestration where most or which involves most the most displacement of disc material and some breaking off and and disc material being where it shouldn't be that stands the best chance of resolving right on its own Plus, the reliability of MRI findings is questionable. I've seen this floating around uh, Instagram and social media in general a lot more in the last few weeks. Um, one woman had 10 MRIs at different imaging centers, and we had a sensitivity of about 50%, which is pretty shitty. Uh, it's important for us to understand because if we're going to base our diagnosis and the things that we do after the fact on the MRI or any diagnostic imaging, we kind of want to know how, how good that image is in the first place. Finally, it doesn't seem to add anything to outcomes versus usual care at three months and six to 12 months follow-up. That's a systematic review by Chu in 2009. So, okay, that's all well and dandy. Should we get an image? I think this statement is pretty helpful from Chu, um, 2009 again, and basically saying that lumbar imaging for low back pain without indications that something else really concerning is going on probably doesn't help any clinical outcomes. So we should probably refrain or at least be a little slower on the trigger um, in terms of recommending or uh, requesting images um, outside of situations that have really concerning uh, symptoms or things just that just don't follow the trajectories that we'd expect, quote unquote, normal or typical uh, painful situations to follow. So pain usually gets better on its own and here's what we can do to help that. Um, because we know that pain usually resolves on its own, we have to be careful, and because regression to the mean is a thing. People can usually feel better over time. But this can make it easy to fall into what's called the post hoc fallacy. Post hoc comes from, it's a shortened version of the full Latin phrase, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Fun fact, I did take Latin in first semester of my undergrad, so there you go. Um, but basically means uh, after this, therefore because of this. So this fallacy, can be exemplified in this example. Um, so say you come to see me for shoulder pain and I use my patented proprietary toe wiggle technique on you and then ask to see you again in two weeks. Um, I may, I know there's a really damn good chance that in two weeks you're feeling better irrespective of what I did. Damn sure that my toe wiggle technique didn't help your shoulder pain, but you come back and you tell me that you're feeling amazing. Um, and then I tell you, yeah, go tell all your friends. And then we've created a false belief, which is problematic. Because again, what I've done for you has nothing to do with you feeling better. So the research seems to indicate that it matters a lot less about what specific techniques we use to treat the issue. It matters much more that we get people moving, being independent, and doing what they can. Passive modalities, things like ultrasound, electrical sim, and so forth, they don't seem to have any good quality evidence to really support their efficacy yet. Maybe it'll change at some point, 
But until then, it probably makes more sense to focus on the things which consistently improve pain, which are, one, reinforcing patient self-care behaviors. And that's highlighting what you or they can do to care for yourself or themselves in daily, <clears throat> pardon me, in daily life. Second is enhancing beliefs and the ability to control pain. And that's education about what pain is, what it isn't. So essentially this entire presentation. And most importantly, convincing you that you have the power to change things and that you're, you're not necessarily a victim. It's not entirely out of your hands and you have a lot of things that you can do. And building self-efficacy and autonomy. So the line that I used, which I mentioned before, is that as a clinician, I hope to never see them in my, in my clinic again. It's kind of a shitty business model, but it's the way that I think an ethical therapist should operate. Well, everything sucks, so now what? I like this quote from Marcus Aurelius, and I stole it again directly from Sposer course notes. You have power of your mind and not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. So recognizing what we cannot do, here is some stuff that we can do. This is going to focus mostly on treatment principles rather than, uh, hey, do this for back pain, because the treatment principles are much more valuable and can be uh, fit into each situation. So first, remember that having pain is normal and it's multidimensional and tissue injury can be one component, but it's far from the only thing that matters. And then let's we'll go back to that cup analogy from earlier. Consider what factors may be relevant to you. So pain presents a bit of a catch-22. It causes distress, frustration, anger, and potentially loneliness, a sense of unfulfillment, and not being yourself. And these feelings can create stress, which keep you sensitized and make your pain persist even longer, and so on and so forth. It's this really crappy cycle. So what do we do? Well, first, we have to recognize the situation that we're in. We, you have pain, and that pain is getting in the way of doing things. The pain is also influenced by many factors, factors which can be changed, and that's where your control is. It's also not the case that you have to change all of these factors. Just changing one or two is enough to make a huge impact, or is often enough to make a huge impact on your pain symptoms. It can be enough to just start to break that, that vicious circle where you're sensitized and then you can't do stuff you want to do and you've got more pain. Maybe you just break that cycle a little bit, and that leads into a positive snowball effect, if you will. So before, when we talked about uh, what we can do, given that our cup is overflowing, we had two options. One is put less in the cup, and the second is build a bigger cup. Think of it this way. Most people can't run a marathon today, but with time and training, they can work their way to doing exactly that. Last thing for us to remember is that having lots of factors that contribute to your pain means that you have lots of opportunities for change. What can we do? Well, you can consider working with a therapist or a healthcare professional. They'll be able to help you examine some of the following. Have you been told that you have some kind of tissue injury? Is it even relevant to your symptoms? Remember that a huge chunk of tissue abnormalities, quote unquote, exists without having any symptoms at all. And if these tissue changes do exist in you, do they really matter with respect to your pain? A therapist can help, discern, help you discern whether or not it's important and what to do about it if it is important. <laughs> Are there any physical habits that you have which may be keeping you sensitized? So it's inaccurate to say that someone has bad posture, let's say, or moves poorly. It's true that certain positions or, uh, or movements can keep us sensitized. And maybe we have habits where we go into these positions or perform these movements frequently enough that they keep us sensitized and the pain persists. Um, they don't allow the, the pain alarm system to settle down. So finding what these triggers might be and modifying them can be really helpful. Are there ways to move differently that don't cause you pain? Are you strong enough or flexible enough to moving that way? There are usually other ways to move that don't cause the same symptoms that we're used to, but we may not have the required strength or flexibility to do that uh, or, or the motor control. If we, if we address this, then there's a greater chance that you won't be in as much pain because we're getting you out of the habits that sensitize you in the first place. Also, we want to look at what meaningful activities are you not participating in because of your pain, and how can we change that? If you can't do the things that are important to you, then you really don't feel like you're you. If you're missing out on activities, experiencing social withdrawal, having to take time off of work, or missing contact with family and friends, all of that can sensitize you. There are almost always ways to change these. So this is a page straight out of Dr. Lehman's book. 
um, and looking at four categories that we want to examine as we're as we're treating pain. So beliefs. We want to ask if you're holding any beliefs, whether they come from medical professionals, friends or family, or personal experience. Also go in Dr. Google, the good old internet in there too. Um, anyone who searched anything related to health on the internet has definitely at one point been told they have cancer, and that's probably not been true. So we have to examine, do they exist in the first place? Do we think that movement and loading is bad for you and will make you worse? I mean, since we're so heavily influenced by what we think, it can become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, even though the research points to exactly the opposite. There's a dose-response relationship with movement and pain, which we need to be aware of. So if you take too much medication, and then you could reasonably expect some side effects. And similarly, if we do more movement than the body is ready for at any one time, we can experience that it will probably contribute to sensitivity. The movement itself isn't bad, our dosage is just crap. Looking at lifestyle factors. All the things in this category are things that most of us could probably stand to improve regardless of whether or not we've got pain. And they may be more important to you, however, due to the impact on pain experience. We talked about these before. Um, let's talk about sleep for a quick sec. If, again, it's a catch-22. People who are in pain often have trouble sleeping, but not getting enough sleep can keep them sensitized, which causes more pain and so on and so forth. So we want to examine these, see where they're at for each person that we're, that we're dealing with and seeing if and how we can change them for the better. Coping strategies. Um, want to figure out if the person in front of us is a more of a, an avoider or a persister. So if, if you fall into either one of those categories, we're probably going to benefit from finding a middle ground. If you're an avoider and you avoid doing anything that causes pain, you should probably start doing a little bit more of some stuff. On the other end, if you keep doing everything despite pain, you're one of those who just grinds away, you probably want to pump the brakes a little bit because your, your grinding probably isn't helping things overall. And then finally, emotional and psychological factors. Sometimes talking to a trusted person, be it a friend, family member, uh, or rehab professional is really helpful in dealing with these stressors. It may also be the case that seeking out the help of a counselor or a psychologist is really helpful and even though there's, there's often a stigma attached to seeking help from a mental health professional, there really, really shouldn't be. A little anecdote, I had someone in the clinic coming in this past week with chronic shoulder pain. He's had it for two to three years. He just underwent a rotator, or sorry, he went, underwent a rotator cuff repair in 2016. He's had pretty well the same levels of pain after. Saw the ortho surgeon, had another MRI. Surgeon says there's nothing else they can do surgically, um, but he was referred to physio. And so we're taking stock of where we're at. And I told him that, all right, you've been through the you've been through the ringer. Here's what we have going on. I definitely think that we can do some things to make you feel better, and this is why. And of his own accord, he asked, "Would it help if I spoke to someone like a counselor?" This is after talking about the multidimensional nature of pain and how our emotions and beliefs and stresses factor into to what our pain feels like. And that kind of floored me. You know, I'm I'm hoping that more people have that, that initial reaction before being prompted. Um, even so, if most people aren't like that patient I talked about, it's up to us as rehab professionals to put that on the table in a gentle way. So, as far as your treatment goes, you might consider general exercise, physical activity, resuming hobbies or meaningful activities, working with a counselor on stress management, getting started on a consistent sleep schedule, giving your body permission to explore any movement, making changes to your diet, and almost anything that makes you happier. So a little bit more about these points. So one, when it comes to general exercise, what are the best exercises for pain? Well, we got three of them. One is the one that you can be consistent with. Two is the one that you don't hurt when you do. And three is the one that you enjoy. So obviously a bit vague, but if we apply those principles, we can find stuff, any situation that we can start to get our dosage right, that leads us to some good stuff in the future. Meaningful activities, if we pick them up again, um, or pick up hobbies, or put enough of the, uh, the hobbies that you can manage, and this is again talking about dosage, um, the ones that are meaningful to you, that should uh, influence you pretty well. You start to feel a little bit more like yourself. Um, want to focus on doing what makes you happy and fulfilled. It can do wonders for your pain and health overall. Um, very last point, focus on your successes. 
as you take steps to improve your pain, it won't likely go away all at once, especially if you're dealing with chronic or persistent pain. And it doesn't have to in order for you to be getting better. Uh, one thing that Mike had said during the course is that when he deals with people with chronic pain, he keeps everything focused uh, or framed in a functional context. Um, I think he said that for insurance purposes on the visit number one, he'll ask about pain or get a pain rating. And then after that, doesn't care. Um, he'll focus on, hey, you're bending further or you're picking that thing up from a lower level than you used to before. That's improvement. That's subjective. That helps a lot, especially given that pain is so subjective and can be a bit finicky. So, for example, if someone could only walk for 10 minutes without pain that week and you walked for, or last week, pardon me, and you walked for 15 minutes without pain this week, that's a huge win. You may not be at your ultimate goal of walking for an hour, but you're objectively closer than you used to be. Framing things in terms of what you can do rather than what you can't completely shifts the entire recovery process or paradigm, makes it more enjoyable, and probably shortens the time span. So, this is Dr. Lehman's book. Um, some principles for physical activity. One thing to ask is what would you do or what would you be doing if you weren't in pain? That might help direct the, the exercises or the activities that we focus our time and energies on. You want to start slow and small and your body and alarm system will adapt over time. Again, it's the idea of running a marathon over the span of months and months and months. Can't do it today, but you'll get there. A quote that, that kind of fits with this is that quote, the doing is the fixing, end quote. And remember that stressing yourself is how the body adapts. We just need to use the right dose and stick with it. So this slide is talking about great exposure, which is important. Again, if, if we adapt via stresses, we'll, we'll expose ourselves to a certain level of stress, and then the body gets better at dealing with that level of stress. And then we need to give it a little bit more, and then it's going to get better at that level. So on and so forth until we get to where we want to be. So these are some ideas in terms of giving someone permission to explore movements um, and maybe hang out just at the edge or just before the edge of where pain is in whatever position or movement that is. Focusing on breathing, contracting, relaxing the muscles, that often has a pretty good impact in terms of modulating the pain. It's not usually changing tissue or it doesn't change tissue in the moment, but it can help to ramp down or inhibit some of the pain signals that uh, we were experiencing before. And you might find that after a bit of time, being smart about it, you can move a little further and access some ranges that you couldn't before or just feel better in those ranges that might have existed before. Now, let's say you're trying that and it doesn't quite change your pain. You know, the pain still stays high or it, it gets worse. But we can modify things, um, take that movement and change it in some way. Um, there really aren't any rules. And when people, when I work with people in the clinic and they ask, what shouldn't I do? I steal Dr. Lehman's line and I say, you can try anything. Just be really honest about how it's making you feel. If it's hurting, let's try adjusting the dose. If we adjust the dose, maybe you do it once or twice, pardon me, and it's still not changing the pain, then okay, why don't we change the movement a little bit or pick something different? Not changing our end goal, but we're it's a lateral move. And then that maybe gets us around the, the object or the challenge that was in our way before. So this is the same approach that a therapist would use with you, um, both with both acute and chronic pain. The key is slow, logical progressions and substitutions or modifications. Try thinking about how you can apply these principles to any pain you have now. Also note that it can still be hard to desensitize things through exposure. If, let's say, after three to six weeks, things aren't getting better or if they get worse than, you, than, uh, than they were, you may want to avoid the movement pattern for a short while, let it settle down, and work on other things that desensitize you. Your therapist or you can, can guide you through the process and help to figure out when that re-entry point would be or where it would be and you can come back to that thing that was a little tougher in it. So these are the most important things to remember. Pain is important, your pain is important, <clears throat> but you're not the first person to have it. And there are things we can do to improve it. The process takes time and consistency and it will not happen overnight unless you're really lucky. Find a therapist who you trust to guide you through the process. Remember that your, your body is strong and adaptive. It will get stronger over time if you ask it to in a reasonable way. And you can change things for the better. That brings us to the end. Um, obviously, you probably can't ask any questions right now, um, but I want to thank everybody who, uh, who listened to this webinar for your time. 
Um, I really hope that something in it was useful um, and that either applies to yourself or to the people that you work with. Um, I want to thank again Quinn and everyone associated with Clinical Athlete for giving the opportunity to present the seminar. And um, as I mentioned before, I've got a bunch of resources. If anyone really, or a bunch of references, if anyone wants that, uh, let me know and we'll hook that up somehow. Otherwise, thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. All right. Hey, that was great, Jerry. I'm going to stop the recording now. Perfect. <laughs>